Well, welcome everybody to day four of our gut health masterclass. So uh, this is the day we are looking at SIBO and Candida. Now for me, um, I didn't actually uh, test positive for SIBO, although I had all the symptoms and that is because they mimic IBS symptoms. And it is actually believed that approximately 85% of IBS is actually SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And also for anybody who's not familiar with candida, that is a yeast infection of which there are many different types of uh, yeast or many different types as well of candida in terms of the strain. Candida albicans being the worst one um, in terms of the difficulty in eradicating it. And clearly that was the one that I was plagued with. So we are going to go through today the different um, symptoms, the different causes, how we can identify the types of tests that we can do. So with your workbook, you've got your digestive um, health symptoms that you can, uh, well, it's a questionnaire basically. So that will be really helpful for just trying to decipher, I guess, whether or not you think there could be underlying SIBO or candida. If you're, if after completing you're still unclear, but it's something that you would like to explore further, um, especially after listening to the masterclass, then by all means get in touch with me um, and we can maybe have a chat around potentially what it could be that, that's causing you your issues because there's so many um, Rachel, if you don't mind going on mute, please, my love. Oh, sorry, I've knocked it off. <laughs> Thank you. Right, so let's get going. So credentials, everybody on here I know knows me super well. Um, if anybody listening um, on a recording or on Facebook when I post it on there, I am Ruth Tansey. I own a health clinic, uh, which I set up in 2011 after leaving a very stressful job. Um, after a run of really poor health, uh, lots of gut issues, I decided to embark on a new career and a completely new life. Um, I wanted to turn my life around. I wanted to get healthy. I wanted to get rid of all my symptoms and I wanted to understand basically what was going on with me and in doing so I wanted to be able to help other people who had similar experiences to mine to get themselves healthy and be rid of their symptoms as well. So that is basically my credentials there. I won't go repeating them all. You can uh, read them because we've been through them quite a few times on here already. So uh, my IBS, which plagued me for the best part of 20 years, and one of the turning points, I guess, for me was this discovery uh, through a stool test that I did in fact have candida. It wasn't the only thing I had. I had a multitude of other things, but candida was one of the things that was really holding me back from my recovery um, and was also the key culprit in my bloating, in my brain fog, uh, probably in a lot of the headaches that I was getting, definitely the food sensitivities through the leaky gut element because the candida for me had gone systemic, which means that it had left my gut and it had gone into my other organs. I was actually under a lung function specialist for um, two years at Wimshaw Hospital because the yeast had invaded my lungs. Um, I had asthma from the age of 12, which had only been mild. I'd have a flare up now and again with a hospital administration, but other than that, generally speaking, really mild. And then all of a sudden, because the candida had invaded my lungs, I, I couldn't get hold of it at all. My inhalers weren't working. I was waking up in the middle of the night, struggling to breathe. It was a really, really scary time. So, um, yeah, one, just to know that when things go systemic, when they leave the gut, because candida can bury its way through the gut wall with these finger-like projections, and it can get into um, other organs and other tissues in the body um, and start really wreaking havoc. Um, it's a massive endocrine disruptor. I had um, real difficulty with my menstrual cycle. Um, my period is completely stopping, um, you know, resulting as well in low thyroid, which was also brought on by stress. So I had a myriad of, of issues going on, but candida was really one of the key ones for me and, uh, you know, noticed significant 
improvements as soon as I embarked on a plan of getting rid of it. So um, we're going to kick start with SIBO. So this is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth for anybody who's not familiar with the term. Now, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth rather than a large intestinal bacterial overgrowth, because in the large intestine, we have a lot of bacteria, but in the small intestine, we don't. And we do not want to have a lot of bacteria there. And we'll come on to the reasons why, um, I think on the next slide. But basically, this is commensal bacteria. So it's not that it's um, disease-causing bacteria or bad bacteria, as we may term it. It's actually commensal. So it started as good bacteria. It hasn't changed in the respect of it was good and now it's bad. It's just there is way too much of it and it is in the wrong place. And this is why it causes us so many of these problems. And like I've said previously, IBS and SIBO, we can basically use those terms interchangeably because the majority of IBS symptoms are a direct result of SIBO. So SIBO and bloating. So bacteria actually digest on the food that we eat and in doing so they cause a lot of gas. So in the large intestine there's only some leftover food and um, the bacteria slowly digest on this food and therefore they don't cause too many problems. Whereas in the small intestine there's lots of easy to digest on food and a lot more space as well because it's a damn sight bigger. So 22 feet in the small intestine versus five feet approximately. I mean, these are approximates in the large intestine. So you can see we've got a huge um, big space for the bacteria. We've got the potential for a lot of bacteria to breed in that. And then also we've got a lot more food that the bacteria can digest on and in doing so create this environment and cause all these awful symptoms. So that is basically in a nutshell how, um, how SIBO is presented. So how the small intestine and large intestine differ when we eat. So they're completely different. So when we eat, the large intestine moves. So it has this peristaltic like wave, like, um, like muscle contractions that propel the food through the colon and start to form it into a stool. And then we get rid of the stool and rid of any toxins, any byproducts of the food that we've ate, anything that we've not been able to digest. Now in the small intestine, it only stops when we stop eating. So this is why fasting can be so helpful when we've got any kind of um, digestive upset because we don't want this bacteria to be able to breed. We want to let the small intestine do this clean sweep. It's called a migrating motor complex. And so if essentially it's every 90 minutes, it will do a clean sweep all the way from the stomach to the um, ileum which is the lower part of the small intestine. And we want this to take place. So for example, when I was really stressed out at work many, many, many years ago when I was working in the corporate world, I just used to find myself constantly eating. It's like I needed the energy. I was running off my adrenals and I constantly felt like I needed to be snacking and eating, um, you know, to keep my brain focused more than anything else. But the resulting factor of that was that I never gave my system the chance to actually do this clean sweep, to keep everything at bay, to move all the bacteria and anything else microbe wise that needed to be cleared out, to be cleared out. I mean, I was very lucky um, in a respect that I didn't actually have um, SIBO. But if anybody does have SIBO and they are constantly snacking, then this is definitely bad practice if we want to be helping to eradicate the problem. So yes, this constant eating just isn't helpful. And a word on sugar, which we all love. I know we all love sugar. Um, it's hard not to, right? And, you know, it's put in so many of the foods that we enjoy to keep us hooked on it. And I have done talks on the toxic truth about sugar in the past. You know, it is not good for us and it is especially not good for us if we have SIBO because bacteria love sugar and they will be most active in producing gas 
when they are presented with sugar. And there are certain types of sugar as well that us humans cannot digest. So if we don't have the opportunity to digest these types of sugar, then all the more for the bacteria to feed upon. So things like your sucralose and um, sorbitol, and then also lactose as well, and the lactulose that, that we cannot digest. These are presented to the bacteria and they have a field day. And in doing so, what do they do? They produce all these types of bacteria, uh, sorry, ba they produce all these types of gas, or I was just admitting Myra there and I'm getting sidetracked. Um, and, and often these unpleasant symptoms, so maybe urgency, uh, some abdominal cramping, uh, could be diarrhea. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's not a nice presentation. So just be aware of how bad sugar is for the system, but also if we have SIBO, definitely something that we uh, want to be avoiding. So symptoms, like I said, they mimic IBS symptoms, but bloating is always one of the top ones that you will um, find that you will be presenting with. Um, flatulence as well, so this increased passing of gas, um, diarrhea or constipation. Now, this will be dependent on the type of gas that the SIBO um, is being caused by. So if it's hydrogen gas, it's diarrhea that you will be experiencing. And if it's methane, then it is um, constipation. There will also be abdominal pain, generally speaking, nausea. Um, and also fatigue. So I'm just going to jump in the chat and just see if anybody's asking any questions. So are honey or maple syrup a better option in small quantities? They're definitely a better option because especially if you get the local honey and you do suffer with any allergies, then that um, will help um, you offset those allergies come the summertime. Um, but yeah, just in, in very small amounts, I would say. And then maple syrup as well, um, small amounts, but it does have, you know, nutrients in there, which sugar does not. Um, honey also has antioxidants in there. And it's also antibacterial and antiviral. Um, but again, if we've got SIBO, we just want to be aware and just really noticing, you know, if we do have a little bit, is that triggering our bloating or our urgency or nausea or whatever it might be? Um, so that would be, um, that would be one just to note. Okay, so causes. So anything that reduces bile uh, gut flow so can cause SIBO. So this could be a blockage due to an obstruction. So that might be some scar tissue. It could be something that's been ingested, um, tumors, hernia, uh, fibroids, which a number of my clients have, or even like a twisting of the small intestine. So it's like when the intestine loops back on itself but most recently is this link between IBS and um, SIBO. So causes, we've got food poisoning. So Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter, Shigella, and also C. difficile have all been um, noted as causes of SIBO. Uh, also things like low stomach acid, um, hypothyroidism is another one because it really slows down metabolism. So everything runs slow. So digestive system runs slow, like we've just said about the migrating motor complex, that's going to run slow. And, and so everything in terms of even constipation is huge um, when we've got a low thyroid. So any kind of blockage in the colon, like we said, but also narcotics or some medications, things like antidepressants, um, gastroparesis, whereby the um, stomach doesn't empty. And again, we talked again about the clean sweeping starts from the stomach, you know, if we've got gastroparesis, then that's not working as it should do. And then this bacteria can build up. And then any impairment in the digestive system, so uh, bile flow, um, pancreatic enzymes, anything like that, because they all work together to basically create an environment that's not friendly to bacteria. And that's the whole reason why they're there. Stomach acid is about you know, keeping those pathogens um, away. It wants to kill anything off that enters um, through the mouth and into the stomach. So how do we test? Breath test. So I have done this just to, um, I do all my tests basically. If I'm gonna advise anyone to do a test, I always make sure that I do it myself, regardless of whether I think I've got 
the condition or not, it's just always a good thing for me to go through to then be able to advise my clients and to know what they're going through as well. So there is um, preparation that needs to happen prior to doing the test, which is pretty much a 24 hour fast. Um, so I always recommend that you do it in the morning so that you can fast overnight. And then it's just water in the morning and it takes approximately, I think it's three or three hours 20 to do the test. And there's 10 vials in all that you breathe into every 20 minutes after taking the lactulose. Now I use lactulose uh, rather than glucose. And the reason for this is because glucose only enters the first, I think it's two, yeah, two feet of the small intestine. Whereas lactulose actually goes through the entire um, length of the small intestine and then also enters into the colon. So with glucose only entering the first two feet, that means that if the SIBO, the, the, the gases basically, if they are not, or the bacteria, if they are not in the first two feet of the small intestine, then we are going to get a negative result. And it could be that they are further through uh, you know, we've just said we've got 22 feet, so that's two feet, we've got 20 feet left. You know, what if the the um, SIBO's there? We need to be able to really, for as far as I'm concerned, look at the whole of the small intestine. So that's why I prefer to use the lactulose rather than the glucose. And we also get to see as well with the, um, with the test that I do, we get to see when the lactulose enters the colon, which is approximately 120 minutes. So we see a real spike then in the, um, in the, in the uh, bacteria, sorry, um, increasing um, due to the lactulose because there's a lot more bacteria, as I said before, in the large intestine than there is in the small intestine. So um, a rise in breath, hydrogen or methane at 15 parts per million above the baseline. So you basically, you've done your fast, you then take your lactulose. So that's your baseline that shows this is, it should ideally be very, very low. And then 20 minutes later, you're doing your first breath and then it will show if you do have that bacteria, that bacteria is obviously going to start to digest on the lactulose and start producing the gas. Um, so basically what we're looking at is within 90 minutes. So we don't want it to be going all the way to 120 because that's when it enters the large intestine or the colon. So this is what a test result would look like. And this is a negative test result because we can see here, this is the baseline reading at zero. And then we want to track it along to uh, 90 to see is this reading, a combined reading, um, 15 parts per million or above. And it isn't on this one. So this would be negative for SIBO. And then this one is a positive read. So here um, at baseline, we've got quite high levels. Um, this can often be because the 24-hour uh, fast, the preparatory diet, which is basically just protein because we don't want to put any carbohydrates in there um, that could stimulate the um, production of the bacteria to digest upon. So um, this could be that this reading actually is likely be that the, um, the, the diet wasn't followed um, fully, but we do get this increased Spike. So this was a positive reading with the combination of methane rise and hydrogen rise together of over 15 parts per million. So conventional treatment is um, antibiotics. So um, rifamaxin is the one that would be chosen to get rid of hydrogen and is 80% effective. And it's actually not a bad um, antibiotic when you look at others on the market. I tend to recommend my clients try to get this in the first instance. There's not many doctors, to be honest, who will prescribe it. I'm not sure. I know in America it's a difficult one for them to get because it is pretty expensive. Um, whether that is, it is just an expensive drug, I'm not sure. And that's why the doctors here are, are um, kind of reluctant to prescribe. I think I've only had one client who's been successful in getting the prescription. 
Um, but that is the one that will normalize the hydrogen levels and should kick the diarrhea into touch. And then tetracycline and um, metronidazole are the ones that are used to treat constipation um, and the methane gas. They have more side effects um, than does the rifamaxin. So it's about weighing up really um, how you feel in terms of using antibiotics. I'm not a lover of antibiotics because the whole reason I ended up with my candida infection was because I had a huge history of taking antibiotics because I used to suffer really, really badly with chest infections from being young. Um, and that was really what set the scene up for me. And I also liked sugar. <laughs> So antibiotics wipe out your ecosystem. Uh, they do nothing to get rid of candida. And then if you, like me, had a major sweet tooth when you were a kid um, and ate lots of sweets, then yeah, you're just really feeding the candida and causing a whole load of mess for yourself really in, in later life. So um, a protocol that we would use for SIBO is the same protocol that we use really for any kind of IBS presentation, 6R protocol, we remove. So we want to remove the, um, the commensal bacteria, we want to bring them down to a level that is acceptable in the small intestine. We want to encourage them to uh, leave the small intestine and go back to the large intestine, making that environment more favorable for them. So literally we want to give them a poor environment in the small intestine so they don't want to live there anymore. Then we want to restore the bowel back to normality. So if there's diarrhea or constipation, we want to have that healthy daily bowel movement or at least ideally two to three movements, but if we're um, maybe constipating, we'd have methane gas and we'd be moving our bowel once a week with help, then it can take a little while to get to be able to move the bowel two to three times a week, but we would, we would aim for uh, two to three times a day, even we would aim for once a day. And then replace, <clears throat> so we want to replace anything that's missing. So that might be the stomach acid, it might be the enzymes that we need so badly to be able to digest our food and therefore not provide this extra food source for the bacteria to feed upon. And then re inoculation is with the probiotics. And then we want to repair and rebalance the gut. So we want to make sure that any damage that's been done to the gut in terms of making it permeable, we heal and seal it up and therefore we prevent any reinfection. So what we would do whilst we're doing all this, the remove stage would include the removal of high FODMAP. So we would follow a low FODMAP diet for six weeks. So we don't really want to be following a FODMAP diet for any longer than this. And I know doctors unfortunately don't follow this view and they will put uh, their patients on low FODMAP diets for um, months and months and months, if not years, um, because what they're doing is they're not actually treating the root cause they're not getting rid of the bacteria that are causing the problem. They are just using the foods that just keep everything at bay. And yes, whilst the diet's been followed, it can mean that there are no symptoms. But then as soon as the client starts to eat normally, you know, they all flare up again. And that's not what we want. So what we want to do is we want to use the antimicrobials, which could be anything from 12 weeks to how long is, you know, a piece of string because it depends how long it's been going on and it will also depend on what else is going on for said individual. So moving on to candida. Um, so this is the yeast infection. Um, generally speaking, it's believed it's brought on by a compromised immune system. And like I said before, candida albicans is the worst strain and therefore the hardest to eradicate, but it can be eradicated. It can just take a little while longer. So symptoms, we've got the bloating, generally speaking, constipation or diarrhea, sometimes intermittent, generally food intolerance due to the leaky gut. Uh, brain fog is quite common with uh, candida infection. Um, also difficulty concentrating, poor memory and cravings for carbs and sugars are pretty huge because that's what it feeds on. So it wants you to keep it alive. It wants to proliferate. So therefore, you know, it makes you really kind of hungry for, for the sugars and, and the carbs. And so in terms of um, symptoms, you can see on the right hand side, the visual um, of the white tongue and then also a vaginal thrush. 
um, but also cystitis can be a very common symptom with candida infection as well. So causes history of antibiotics, such as I said with myself, um, just leaving the candida to thrive. Anybody who's had a super high sugar diet, you know, all the fizzy drinks, even these probiotic drinks are absolutely full of sugar, sugary yogurts as well. People think, oh, it's yogurt, it's healthy, but they are absolutely teeming with sugar. Alcohol as well, and especially beer and wine because of the yeast element there. You know, if we're drinking uh, regularly and we're drinking or over drinking, then, you know, this can damage the delicate gut wall and can lead on to inflammation, can lead on to leaky gut and can cause candida as well. Bread obviously contains a lot of yeast and this is quite often why people who have candida are maybe okay with some forms of wheat but bread is an absolute killer and I know this used to be the case for me. And then stress or any illness which in effect is a stress on the system or like I said, the compromised immune system, you know, all has this knock-on effect on the ecosystem. And we need this really robust ecosystem, which we're going to come on to tomorrow, in order to keep everything in check. Um, this is our army, basically, um, you know, prevent these overgrowths of um, bacteria and, and yeast infections. So the tests that we do, we've got stool, urine and blood. Stool is definitely my preferred because it actually shows the strain. And I know more so than what I'm dealing with and it will give me the level as well. And I can tell whether it's a potential pathogenic um, strain of, of yeast and generally give me an idea of how long I might need to uh, get rid of it for, for whoever I'm working with. Um, urine though can be really good because urine will show if it's in the small intestine so this is an organic acid test which will show whether candida is invasive in the small intestine because quite often we can get a negative read on a stool sample it might be that we've done a load of work cleared out as i did with myself the candida from the um from the colon but I still had these niggly symptoms and I was like, I just don't, didn't feel like it had gone. And I did an organic acid test and there it was. It was still residing in the small intestine. So I still had work to do. And then a blood test we can do, um, an IgG blood test, um, which can be used alongside a food in, uh, sensitivity test, which some of them will show whether there is candida or a yeast infection present. So just to show you um, a test here. So this is um, the culture part from the GIFX stool test that we use um, as part of the Transform You've Got program. And you can see at the bottom, the mycology section there for this particular client, there were two types of um, candida present, both at one plus. Um, if you look up to the microbiology legend there on the left hand side, it shows, um, so no growth, non-pathogenic is green, potential pathogen is in the uh, yellow and then pathogen is red. So pathogen means disease. So we can see for both of those types of candida, if they were to move up by one point only, they would become a potential pathogen. And again, the candida protocol follows exactly the same as a SIBO. We get rid of the yeast. We restore the bowel to normality. We replace anything that's missing. We get the probiotics in there that the client needs uh, based on their test results. And then we get repairing the bowel. And again, it's a yeast um, free diet. So 12 weeks to potentially 12 months, depending on how long this has gone on for the client. You know, is it a couple of years or is it, could it be 20 years like it was with me before it got investigated? And um, so again, antifungals, you know, 12 weeks, if it's probably quite a recent infection to probably 12 months, if not longer, if it's been around for some time. So for me, the reason why I do the work that I do is because I don't want anybody to go through what I went through um, because I was miserable. I was absolutely miserable for the majority of my 20s, if I'm completely honest. Um, the amount of time that I spent in and out of the consultant room, in and out of hospital, trying medications that didn't work, um, feeling miserable, always flaring up whenever there was a social event and just then 
feeling like I never wanted to, to go out, although I really did want to go out, you know, as a young girl and I should have been living the life I wanted to live. And I really wish there'd been a program like this around for me back then, because I would have jumped on it. Um, so I want you to know that if you are struggling, if you're at a loss, if you're frustrated and you don't know which way to turn to just book in and have that free consultation and let's just work through what potentially might be going on for you and see whether or not we can work together. So day four got health masterclass giveaway. We have another food diary. So I will let you guys know tomorrow who um, who was a lucky winner of the food diary review. And um, I will, what else will I do tomorrow? Uh, I think I've forgotten already what I'm going to do tomorrow. So anyway, any questions? Um